Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Grady Small, and this is my partner, Emily Spencer. And I'm super excited to present to you our presentation on Kirigami and architecture. So to begin, climate control is a massive problem in urban environments. Um, on average, they can be about 4.5 to 5 degrees warmer than their surrounding suburbs. Now, in the winter, this may be beneficiary, but as anyone who's walked through New York on a hot summer day will tell you, not so much. Um, this is only exacerbated by the current architectural trend of all glass skyscrapers, which are terrible at internal building environment regulation, as well as reflecting a ton of heat back into the city itself. Uh, Bill de Blasio actually went on record last week saying we need to ban the classic glass and steel skyscrapers as they are incredibly inefficient. And some poor guy in London's Jaguar was melted when a death ray from a reflective building <laughs> heated the car up to a point of melting. So this is some data from the Department of Energy on energy usage in commercial buildings. As we can see, uh, what we care about is highlighted in red. That's heating, ventilation, and cooling. And that accounts for about 44% of the energy in buildings as a whole. Obviously, this will add up. Um, current solutions are not very efficient. The hottest trend coming out of Silicon Valley is a smart shade. So these will be a Wi-Fi enabled shade which will hopefully adjust themselves to the weather outside. As you can imagine, they're gonna be incredibly costly, especially when you're retrofitting for an entire building. Then you have a metal framework, which you can see on some buildings in campus if you wander up to the bio labs. Um, while these might look nice, they are not very flexible and only really work two times a day. And then finally, we get to the classic interior building shade. Um, everyone knows them, no one really loves them, they're not very efficient, and at this point, they're pretty obsolete. So we took a look at some existing research, and we found first that water can be collected even in the most arid of climates. Um, this research existed in a desert, and they showed that they could collect water on a metal organic framework. Next, we looked at some geometries in nature, specifically the Saracenia trichome, which is a plant that collects water for itself through maximization of edge area and a hydrophobic exterior. We combined this with our other inspirations, which of course included water as a coolant. As everyone in this room knows, water works fantastically as an evaporative coolant. Um, as I mentioned, we looked at some existing geometries in nature, including that Saracenia trichome. And finally, kirigami. Kirigami is very similar to the Japanese art of origami. However, it involves an extra degree of freedom added through cutting the paper as well as folding. So how can we apply these inspirations to architecture to save money and harvest some water? Our solution involves an exterior kirigami building envelope. So as you can see in this first schematic, when it's cloudy outside or there's a dew point, water will collect on the outside of our envelope. Now water will collect on the envelope itself as well as propagate down into a hydrogel. As a hydrogel becomes saturated, it will apply a tensile force to the envelope, which will open the envelope and allow for sunlight in on those cloudy times when you need the sun coming into your building. Then you take a look at our next schematic. As the sun is coming up, evaporation begins. So that'll provide us with two things. First, it'll cool down the building, as I mentioned, evaporative cooling. And second, it will slowly allow the hydrogel to become less and less saturated, allowing that envelope to close itself up as the sun is coming through, and you want some shade on your building. Finally, we get to our third schematic, and at this point, all of the water has evaporated away, and it is the hottest part of the day. Our envelope has closed itself up to completely to shade our building from all of the sunlight coming through. So our approach can be boiled down into four steps. First, we did a material selection process. We then moved on to fabricate. We did some iterative design testing, and then finally did some testing for water collection. Our material selection could be boiled down into five factors. We needed a material that was durable, as it would need to withstand the outside of a building. We also needed a material that was insulating, otherwise our whole project would be moot. We needed a material that was lightweight, as to not apply too much excess strain on the outside of a building. We needed a treatable surface to apply a hydrophobic coating, and we needed a material that was flexible to allow for our kirigami design. So we ended up setting on an aluminum-coated polyethylene tarp phthalate. Now, everyone in this room knows these two materials. Aluminum is one of the most common metals in the world, and polyethylene tarp phthalate, or PET, is the material used in disposable water bottles. So that PET provides an insulation factor, which we desperately need, and the aluminum applies a treatable surface, which I will now pass off to my partner, Emily, to speak a bit about. Thanks. Yeah, so the treatable surface is really important because we wanted to be able to apply a functional coating to our material, and that basically allows it to have additional properties. So we decided we wanted to add an omniphobic coating, um, mainly for two factors. One, it'll help repel dirt, so when it's on the outside of a building, it won't get really filthy. Um, and then also, uh, omniphobic coatings allow for the formation of larger water droplets on a surface, which is important because the higher the volume of those water droplets, the more water we can get on the surface. And when you have more water on the surface, that's a lot better for evaporative cooling. 
Um, so we decided on um, PMHS as our omniphobic coating. It's a siloxy-based polymer, and we chose it for a few reasons. Um, one, it's really cost-effective, so um, in terms of scale, this would be a really easy material to apply going forward. It's also a really great um, water collector as well. So it was an obvious choice, especially because it can bond easily to the aluminum on the AL-coated PET. Um, then once we figured out our whole material system, we had to move on to figuring out how we were going to fabricate our envelopes. So we used two main processes. Um, one was a Cricut cutter. The Cricut cutter allowed us to create those Kirigami geometries on our samples. Um, it's essentially like a desktop printer, but instead of having a uh, inkjet, it has a blade. So we were able to create our designs in Illustrator and then upload them into the Cricut cutter and it would create um, a uniform pattern every time for us. Then in order to apply our uh, omniphobic coating, we used a dip coating method. And so this allowed us to apply a really uniform layer across the surface. And that's important because we want to be able to have a really smooth surface to help um, form the water droplets. So once we got all of that stuff out of the way, we were ready to move on to our geometry. Um, the, in the beginning, we were just creating designs out of Tyvek, just trying different stuff out. We even made a holiday design um, of our building envelope. You can see here with the Christmas trees. Um, and it was really fun being able to just try out basically whatever. Um, but we did keep some factors in mind during early prototyping. We knew that we wanted to be able to maximize edge area. Um, as you saw with the Sarasenia trichome, edge area is really important because that's where water droplets like to nucleate. So the more water droplets we can get onto the surface, the better. Thus, the more edge area on the surface, the better. So we were trying to create designs with a lot of edge area. We also wanted to make a streamlined design, so water could easily transport down to saturate that hydrogel. Um, and finally, we wanted an envelope that moved. Um, so we wanted to be able to create something that when um, it was open, it could let light in, but it also could shade um, at the right times of day. So uh, right now, you're getting samples. Um, we went through a few more designs and then came up with what you're getting right now. Um, and that, if you pull, um, it'll open up. So um, our final design was an accordion-like design. We have a large one up here as well. Um, and when it's closed, it com can completely block the light. It can also easily be like, rolled up and stored. Um, and it, because it's flat, the water will quickly transport down the surface into the hydrogel below. Then when that hydrogel is saturated and the uh, building envelope is open, then you get these holes. And the holes are really important because they let light through, so it's almost like you just have a screen on the outside of your window. And also, the holes act like little shelves. So you've got the um, shelf part that allows water just to sort of sit on it, and that gives you a lot more water that can stay on the surface, which is really great for evaporative cooling. Um, so we did some testing with this design to show um, that it was effective. We did the contact angle test, which basically is a measure of hydrophobicity. It showed that uh, the, basically the larger the contact angle, which is this right here in red, the larger the water droplet is on the surface. And when you have larger water droplets with higher volume, that means each droplet can hold more water and you're getting more water across the surface. And we saw from our testing here that the um, AL-coated PET with our PMHS layer gave us a lot higher contact angle than just plain PET, which is already fairly hydrophobic on its own. So this was a pretty good result. Um, and it meant that we were getting a lot larger droplets on our sample, which will become important later on. Um, as you can see here, we did some water collection testing. Um, we basically just hooked up a humidifier um, to this big rig and just blasted our sample with like a mist. Um, and that we, have, we're able to form water droplets on the surface that you can see here. And you can watch how sometimes they'll propagate down. Um, and you can also see the shelves right here that I was talking about, how the water is sitting on those shelves. Um, which in a lot of our other designs and a lot of um, other people who have thought about this, that really wouldn't be possible. So this is a really unique thing that we are able to accomplish. Um, you can see another angle of those shelves right here. And an important thing to note is that this was after all of the um, humidifier had been turned off. There's no more condensation happening. So um, you can have this water storage even when condensation isn't actively happening, which is really important because that means that you have this whole saturated surface that is doing evaporative cooling. So you have it across a vast area, which means you can get it all around the building. Um, that makes it a lot more efficient. Also, we have here our um, graphs 
So you can see the red line up there is the envelope when closed. It's collecting water a lot faster. Um, and so that means that when it's closed, you're getting all that water going down into the hydrogel. And then when it's open, you're getting most of the water staying on the envelope. And that means that it's going to be used for evaporative cooling, which is what we want. Um, so to conclude, we created a novel uh, material geometry for a building envelope with, uh, coupled with an ideal material selection that allowed us to create a really unique result that both gives us aesthetic functionality and all the architects we talked to were really interested in the design and they actually liked it. <laughs> and um, one of the things about building envelopes is usually they're just like, that's ugly, I don't want to think about it. But they're like, this is actually something that um, we would consider putting into a design in the future. Um, and then also we created something that could collect water a lot more efficiently um, than anything we've seen in the past, which is really great. Um, so we're currently looking into a design patent for our work and hopefully in the future this will save buildings on energy cost and um, bring about a green revolution combating the evils of glass skyscrapers. <laughs> So thank you so much. Um, we'd like to thank all the people who have helped us on this project, including uh, Dr. Chan, Dr. Yang, Dr. Bram, um, as well as Vicky, Yongju, Jingli, um, and Singita. So thanks, everybody. We're open for questions. Yeah, so um, the good thing about this material is that um, the way that it's designed, it is really easy to take on and off of a building, but also we do know that the glass transition temperature for PET is around, I think, 90 degrees, 80 to 90 degrees Celsius, and so you're going to be pr pretty much fine in the summer heat, and if there's issues with freezing, um, like we don't really want the envelopes to freeze, but in that case, you can either have housings on the building that will um, allow the envelopes to retract, or you can just take them off when you're winterproofing your building. One of the great things about PET is it is durable, which is not great for our oceans, but uh, great for our envelopes. Yeah. Yeah, so when it's closed, can you see on it? So it, it, it bends in a way it will work right when it's cloudy and all is open, so it's not like a bend. Sometimes it's hot, it's closed, so it's sometimes pushing. Would you be unable to look out the window? Yeah. <laughs> So our idea is that it would close at the highest part of the day. So once all of that's evaporated, then you have the shade where you're going to want it anyway in terms of it's going to block the sun, so it's going to help with cooling. But if you don't want that, if you want more autonomy, there's also the option where you can integrate these into a more automatic system where you just have a mechanical way of opening and closing. Um, so you could open and close them like a traditional blind if you would like as well. It just depends on how the building contractor would want these installed. Are they It will be, yeah. At a, at a bigger scale, it would be semi-permeable, and you can kind of see that just, that just forms from the slits. Um, but it will block most of the light, and unfortunately, most of the vision. There is just some bargaining that's going to have to be done, we think, especially regarding the glass skyscrapers in the future. And even different levels of opacity we've thought about, too. Yeah. I was just going to show, like, if you you can see through a little bit, see? So there's gonna be, it's not gonna be like a completely like black room, but it is a pretty good shade. Like I'm not blinding you guys with this, so. In the uh, hottest part of the day, you might wanna consider using this as a solar source for generating power, so you can reduce your energy. That is something we've thought about actually um, with the advancing of perovskite solar cells, something that can be flexibly applied to a layer like this, that's something that once those are in a place where they're going to be commercially viable, that's something that I think definitely could be yeah. um, good for the future. It's a great idea. Yeah. I noticed you talked at the beginning about the reflective effect on the outside environment. This seems reflective as well. Have you considered, well, is this going to make a difference for Melting Jaguar? <laughs> so, so the, unfortunately, with the, the second question is, have you, have you thought about uh, or getting down what other types of materials in terms of reflectivity, what effect that might have? 
Yeah, we've definitely thought about adding possibly a layer to the exterior that we should make the aluminum less reflective, and that definitely exists already. Um, unfortunately, with the Jaguar situation, the building itself was just curved inward, it created which like a created lens this of focused death. death ray that this poor guy just happened to park in the middle of. Um, we used to have a picture, but they've now retrofitted that building with just this ugly shade. Um, a piece of fabric. So luckily with these is they will be moving the entire day. So no singular death ray can form because they'll be in constant motion. Yeah, the um, irregularity is really yeah. helpful there. There might be like five minutes where someone's car gets a little bit too hot, but hopefully it's not concentrated it's not for the whole melt. day. <laughs>